Hey everybody, Tim the Tone Priest here. We're back inside this 1967 Gibson GA-20 RVT Minuteman amplifier. Tell you what's going on here. I uh, did put this on the Rumble Dyno. And the reason I chose Rumble is like the, uh, the song for the Dynamometer is because, you know, I was hoping to be able to do it first take, one take, one take, first take. Uh, but that was not the case in the last one, so we need to go back and uh, do that again. But in the meantime, I uh, took the chassis out again. We're going to do some uh, tweaking and some modding, and we're going to uh, crank this sucker up a notch. I was doing some research over on Rob Robinette's website, and um, yeah, I think we're going to mess around with that. Another notch! But uh, first things first. When I removed the original bias resistor cathode bypass capacitor, the one that was over here, uh, looked like one of these guys, like right here. Can you see that? We got a bunch of these capacitors right here. And these are all measuring horribly. They all need to be replaced. And while I was looking at those, I noticed that they are all very small values, like fender and... You know, the, the common value to use for a, you know, preamp tube cathode bypass capacitor is like 25 microfarads. And we have a one micro here. We get a point. No, no, we don't. Uh, we get a point two two here. We get a five micro here. That's the normal channel. And then down here on Reverb's channel, uh, we get a five micro, a point. No, we don't. I keep telling the stack, you rascal. Uh, a one here. And then we go back up here, and that's uh, third stage. Anyway, so those need to be replaced. And i got to say, this amp sounds very, very good. Uh, it reminds me a lot of the JCM900 I just did, like the clean channel or normal channel, not the high gain channel, um, which is not to say that you can't get nice distorted tones out of this because this is what it excels at. But great distortion, great saturation, uh, but there's like no bass. I'm all on by that bass, by that bass, no trouble. You know, which is fine for a lot of people. It's very, very tight. You know, especially with um, diode rectification rather than tube rectification. You know, this sucker is a very tight, responsive, immediate amp right there. And it's, uh, it's a rock and roll machine. This is like a... Angus Young in a box, a little tiny, smaller box than you would expect. But uh, you could do AC-DC all day long with this amp. But it does not have uh, the low end where you hit like a chung. You know, it doesn't go boom. Does that make sense? The boom. Boom. All right. Anyway, uh, hopefully that makes sense. It's just there's no low end at all. So we're going to see if we can address that. And I think the... Bypass capacitors have a lot to do with that. Another thing we may try on the normal channel, we may have some fun with this uh, value right here and turn this into a cold clipper, like a Marshall. And then finally, after all that, if we still uh, think there's room for improvement, we may go in on the normal channel, uh, mess around with the tone stack. Might try a Baxendall tone stack on this, but uh, we'll see. The uh, potentiometers they're using are both 2 meg potentiometers, which seem awfully high, but, you know, we're getting a little bit above my pay grade here. But uh, first things first, we've got to uh, get these old electrolytics out of here because they are completely well past their expiration date. And now uh, we'll do some experimentation and see what we get. All right, if that all sounds interesting to you, hang tight. Here we go. All right, this is what we're going to do here. We're going to use these three in the normal channel. And what do we have here? We have a 10, a 2.2, and a 25 microfarad capacitor. So this one is going to be bumped up to 10. This 2.2 is going to be bumped up to a 2.2. And then this 5 will be bumped up to a 25. So we'll get those uh, old ones out of here that are no good. And we'll replace them with those, and all of them will have increased values. Does that make sense? So while we're at it over here, uh, I just removed the 
capacitor in question out from here, but right next door to it is this guy here, which is on here somewhere. Uh, this guy right here. 0 0.001, and these brown capacitors don't have a great reputation for longevity. And there is a little bit of funkiness in the reverb channel. And I've had problems with the reverb in both the uh, GA20s that I did. Just kind of like this, there's some noise or crosstalk or a little bit of oscillation. And it sounds like, uh, well, it doesn't sound good. So uh, while we're here, we may as well uh, change that and hope that has a positive effect on our reverb. Uh, we pulled this guy out. And he was just slightly over tolerance and um, was not acting like a resistor. So he was good, except for, you know, I ripped the leg off in the process. This right here, this uh, solder point did stick in 20 pounds of crap in a 5 pound bag there. And that's the last ground point before it actually grounds to the chassis of the jack here. But uh, he'll be fine. So there's our cathode uh, bypass cap, and we're going to stick this guy in to replace the brown turd capacitor, and then uh, we'll move on. All right, we replaced the cathode bias bypass capacitors in question. So we got a 10, we have a couple of 2.2s, and we have a 25 here. And on the old schematic, we have, come on, get out of there. We have a 10 here, a 2.2 here, and here. I replaced this one because we were in that area, and we were going to replace that anyway. This is the reverb channel, and uh, we'll get back to the reverb channel later. Uh, and finally, on the third stage, which uh, both channels use, uh, we have a 25 instead of a 5. So this should be pretty kicked up. Let's see what it sounds like. All right, we've got it fired up. And one thing's for certain, we uh, definitely have amplified the noise floor. Uh, but that's where these things here, interference and maybe lead dress and stuff. We'll uh, worry about that later. But yeah, we uh, mission successful here. <coughs> Probably tune up before I do this shit. When will I learn? Here, I'm gonna poke around with the chopstick to see if it's a lead dress issue or you know what kind of issue it is. But I'm not worried about the noise for that'll be fine. We'll be fine. Don't worry about a thing. We got this. All right, check this out. Tapping on this white wire here. And that's going to tube number four, pin eight, which is a grid wire for normal channel second uh, gain stage so what I think we're gonna do now is gonna save to the end but what I'm gonna do now is we'll get some shielded wire for that and also let me shut this down before 
I go insane. You like it? Um, if we look over here, we look at the reverb knob right here. Look behind him. We should see a green wire going to the sweeper right here. This uh, green wire is basically a signal wire that goes all the way across this amplifier. You know, just sucking up static and electrical interference and stuff like that. So, we'll replace this guy with a shielded wire and this guy with a shielded wire. And uh, we'll see how that, uh, see if that helps at all. Let's do it. And of course, before we go sticking our hands back in there, we're going to discharge the filter capacitors. All gone. All gone. And they always take a little bit of a deep breath and try to come back at you, but, you know, half a volt ain't going to hurt nobody. At least of all the tone priest. We're on a mission from God. For me and the Lord, we got an understanding. All right, very important. When you're using shielded wire for your grids, and we can see our connection here, sort of, maybe, maybe not. Um, got one lead going over here, and then the eyelet next door to him is a ground point, so we were able to ground the shield right there. And we're going to be going across here to this point right here, but... The important thing is, uh, shielded cable is only grounded on one side, so it's going to be grounded on this side, but not on this side. If you ground it on both sides, you kind of defeat the purpose. You get ground loops, you get noise, you get all sorts of bad stuff you don't want. All right, and the uh, ground wire I'm using is actually a cable. You can see that thing right there? It's got a little cable end. This is Bing Fu antenna connectivity. This right here, Bing Fu SMA male to SMA female bulkhead mount. Uh, but the wire they use is the uh, important thing. Uh, I can't, probably can't read that. What's this stuff called? Ah, RG174 wire. And it's fine. It's fine. Works great. All right, let me get this uh, hooked up to the tube, and then we'll do the, uh, the reverb wire. Yeah. All right, so uh, we got this shielded wire in, and it's no longer microphonic when I tap it. But uh, while I was tapping it, I think I found our problem, which is right here. Oh, there's your freaking problem right there. That's why this thing was acting like an antenna. We forgot to put this guy back in his hole. That's what she said. Got to put him back home. All right, that should help. Let me uh, do that. Yeah, dummy. Well, that's a little better. Uh, wrong knob. Ooh, she's a beast. So, besides your brain, your ears, and your eyes, the most useful and important tool to an amplifier repairman is a chopstick. And that's how we found that problem right there. Uh, that green wire is... Where's Mr. Schematic? Uh-oh. little lamp died again. Um... So what was disconnected was this guy right here. It's a grid wire going into the reverb recovery stage of amplification, which is making me think um, because this amp, I said, you know, with the reverb on, there's some kind of, you know, um, some leakage or some oscillation or some, um, which of who's it? Um, Microphonics going on, and I had the same problem with the other amp. It's make me, making me wonder if, you know, the grid wires associated with the reverb portion of the circuit could be to blame for that. Could also just be worn out tired reverb tanks, but on the first one of these amps I did, I tried a, several re reverb tanks, and it sounded great with the tank outside of the chassis, like on a pillow. But the other amp, especially, you know, you stick it inside here, it was just absolutely unusable. It would just self-oscillate into oblivion. But, um, all right, let's give her a quick play, and then we'll move on to uh, futzing with the cold cathode. And the uh, cold cathode, yeah, cold cathode, cold clipper. See what happens. Strangers in the house. 
Can you see the real me? Da, 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 da. All right, basic treble are on five, volume is on zero. Oh yeah, we said we we're gonna tune up. Well, we'll do that later. journey all right this is the plan should we choose to accept it so we come in out of our guitar we get amplified go through the tone stack and then we come over to the second triode or the second stage of amplification and it's uh, got a pretty uh, normal bias so a 1.5k cathode bias resistor and we get a 100k plate load resistor pretty bone stock standard what we're gonna do Let's take a book out of Marshall, and this came from uh, Rob Robinette's excellent website. Uh, what we're going to do, cold clipper, we'll get rid of that 1.5K. And, uh, shit, I guess we're going to remove that uh, bypass cap we just installed. That's fine. Get him out of the way. Anyway, we're going to replace the 1.5K with a 10K. And then he also mentions... Um... Soldano, probably an SLO 100 OG one, uses 39K. And uh, I didn't read this. I don't read crap. I just look at the pictures. Um, but anyway, uh, we'll go with Marshall, 10K. And then we'll take, or actually, now nah, we'll go with 10K. Go with 10K. Here we go. Actually, we don't have 10K in stock. Well, we probably do, but probably the shitty uh, Amazon resistors. So we'll uh, go with 15K. That's the worst that could happen. All right, we got our 15K cold clipper cathode bias resistor tempt in. We still have the original uh, bypass cap and resistor uh, just hanging by one lead in case we don't like this, and uh, we're going to put it back to normal. But, uh, yeah, let's see how this sounds. Should be awesome. All right, we have the cold biasing resistor installed, and uh, the results are in, and it's uh, not exactly what I was expecting, but it's interesting. The amplifier normal channel is much quieter now. So we'll put it on two where it was before, and two before was kicking up the jams. Motherfucker! Very quiet, very clean. Oh, very out of tune. So about six now is where two was before. Try putting the uh, bypass capacitor on there and see what that does. So uh, let's do that. All right, this is with the 15K bias resistor on the second preamp tube and a 2.2 microfarad bypass capacitor. Oh, and a broken knee. Ow. Get a little more gain. 
it's still a lot less flying than before. I kind of like it, but I also kind of like where it was before. Why isn't this shutting off? No, we're not off. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is add a switch. So we'll have selectable uh, bias resistors on that, that stage. That way we can have the best of all worlds. And who doesn't like that? Um, I'm not going to drill in the face or the back of the amp. I'll probably see if I can stick it, you know, underneath, behind. And, uh... Ooh, pardon me. Ugh, disgusting. Yeah, that's what we'll do. All right, let's do it. All right, before we go ahead and install that switch for our selectable... Oops. Cold clipping bias resistor. I thought it would be fun if we talked about what exactly we're doing here. So I apologize for the bad camera angle. I just don't have space and or time to do this Scorsese style. All right, so let's draw a line here. This is going to be voltage. Uh, no, actually, this is going to be time. The single's time. And this is voltage. Right here is zero voltage at zero time. So a guitar signal is an alternating current signal. Looks like this. All right. Now the frequency is how high the note is. So if these waves are closer together, that's a higher frequency, a higher note. And then conversely, if these waves peak to peak are further apart, that's a lower note. But what we're concerned with here is the amplitude, and that's uh, the gain on this. So this could be the same like this, low gain, quiet, like that. I screwed that up. It should be like this. Okay, that would be quiet, low gain, low voltage, or the same frequency really loud as this one that I originally drew. Now, what we're doing here is this again. We're biasing the tube to what is called cold clip. So when a stage of a vacuum tube amplifies a signal and we increase the voltage so much, it only has a limited amount of uh, ability to increase the loudness or the gain before it starts clipping. So what, they, what you normally do is you bias the tube and for 12AX7, 6U7, with a 100K plate resistor and 1.5 cathode bias resistor, that sets the operating point in the middle, which would be around here. So you have equal room up here and down here before it starts to clip. And the top, when you crank it all the way up and you get into clipping, the top part of the wave and the bottom part of the wave will start flattening out and turning into something like this at the same time. Now, what the cold clipper does is called asymmetric clipping. And we're changing the operating point is we're setting the operating point, which is the middle, right here. So what's going to happen when you increase the amplitude, increase the gain, increase the volume, you're much closer to shut off down here than you are up here. So the wave will start to clip or to round off there. But on the other side, you still have plenty of room up there. So it's squaring off, which is distortion or saturation on one half of the wave. But the other half of the wave still has a lot of headroom. Does that make sense? And that is what is asymmetrical clipping. And it has a distinct sound, which you just heard. 
Uh, some people like it, some people don't. Uh, this is supposed to have good even order harmonics, I believe, which are more pleasant to the ear than odd order harmonics. So do your own research and uh, you can definitely go down a nice rabbit hole there. But anyway, that's what we're doing. Cold clipping, we're biasing the vacuum tube to move the operating point down and that sets it so the uh, you have less room on one side of the wave than on the other side. And so it clips on one side before it does on the other side. And clipping or squaring off of the wave is that nice distortion that we all like. Does it all make sense? I hope that made sense. Hoping it screwed that up. All right, let's add a switch. All right, apologies for the bad camera angle again, but uh, we're doing what we can. So what I have in stock, I have a 4.7K, the 15K we were just using, and a 47K. And... What we're going to do is, we're going to use this switch to either just use the middle resistor, which is the 47K, or it's a three position switch, so that'll put these guys in parallel, this side will be going to ground, or flip the switch the other position that'll put these guys in parallel. So we're going to have 47K which might be a little high. Um, the Soldano uses a 39K, so we may use, I think I have a 33 or something in stock. Uh, but let's see the values you get, yep. Hopefully you can see this. Yeah, yeah, there we go. So 47K, and if we put that in parallel with the 4.7, we get 40. If we put it in parallel with the other guy, we get 11. And yeah, the Marshall had, had um, 10K. So yeah, this might be okay. Um, let me grab the other value I have that's one step smaller than the 47. See what we got. We might go with that instead. Hang on. All right. So I got a 33K here. So if the switch is in the middle position, it'll be 33K. And if we go in one position, oh, get you in the frame. Good job, Spielberg. In the frame, in the frame. Now you can't see the multimeter. This is a mess. Uh, what do we got? Four. And then we add this in parallel with the other resistor. Flip the switch the other way, we get be somewhere around 10 I believe yeah 9.8 yep that'll work let's do that and don't forget we're gonna have the reverb channel as well which is um, more stock to the actual schematic so it won't have the uh, cold clipper in it and you know if you don't like the cold clipping just unplug it from one channel stick it in the other and you get reverb and tremolo how about that all right we have our mod installed oh Jesus can you see that probably not See that? Right there we have our switch. And then I added a little uh, tag strip there. And the tag strip, one of the um, tags is uh, connected to the little eyelet that, you know, screws into the chassis. So that's a ground. That's a chassis ground. Uh, hopefully that doesn't add a ground loop or any extra noise. If it does, we can go back and, you know, tag them to the other ungrounded tag and then run a wire to uh you know the ground scheme that they got going on here so they'll all ground at the uh, jack like that i don't think it'll add any more ground uh any more noise you know certainly any more than running a wire from over here to somewhere else and then to somewhere else again so hopefully uh we won't have any ground loops and added noise for this but anyway so the switch is in the middle position we flip it towards the back go to 10k which is Marshall spec we go all the way forward we get 4k which isn't too far removed from the you know optimal 1.5k bias resistor which would give you max headroom well these rock things are all very well if you like them but you know and the middle position is 32 very cold right there so let's start off uh, at 4k 
I'll plug her all back in and uh, do a sound check. Well, ordinary people like you oughtn't to be afraid to speak up for classical music. All right, let's try her out. So we'll do three sound samples. Uh, I've got the volume and the uh, tones all set at five. I'll start in the first uh, switch position, which is four ohms. Then we'll go to 4K ohms, four kilo ohms. Then we'll go to 10K, and then we'll go to 32. And you'll notice as we step up, we're gonna lose volume, um, but it'll start to get more character when you match the volume that you lost with the, uh, the volume. Or something like that, we'll figure it out. Okay, so we're at uh, 4K. the volume that we had at 4k. Basically I'm gonna turn it up another number on the volume knob. on here because this thing just fucking goes out to me all the time but yeah the amp is pretty awesome all right so here's where we're at i wanted to play around with the tone stack we have bass and treble controls and i did do a little bit of playing around here um added capacitors in parallel added a uh, resistors in parallel and you know played around with it to see how it would sound and there was really no you know, difference worth speaking of. Um, this is a very poor, especially the base, very poor design. I had the multimeter hooked up to it between the sweeper and this leg here. They're not using the other leg. And the full range, all right, so you set it to zero, and the, re the DC resistance red was like 50 ohms. And then when you, I got it up to three, I was getting about 250 kilo ohms. And then from 3 to 10, it goes from 250 to like 258 kilo ohms. So this is all you get for base control right here between 0 and 3. So this is a horrible design. Not exactly sure what I want to do with this. Um, 
now with the changes I've made with the Kolb Clipper and the um, increase in the cathode bypass capacitors, this thing almost has too much bass on this channel. And we don't have a lot of control here. And it, the controls, like uh, the frequencies being affected, aren't quite the ones we need. And the tone is very mid forward. So I'm thinking we might want to play around with a, um, a Fender style tone stack because that has, you know, a nice um, scooped sound to it. Cut out a little bit of that mid range. Or possibly a box. I was playing around with the Tone Stack calculator on the internet. And I'll, I'll leave a link in the description if you want to play with that. But the Vox may do the trick we want to do with this as well. And those would be the easiest to implement. I think regardless of how we go forward, I'm going to have to add, you know, another tag strip in here somewhere, which I wanted to avoid. But you got to do what you got to do. But I ain't going to do that this weekend. So, you know, um... That being said, we have a nice, you know, sounding normal channel. I mean, this sounds great as it is. I mean, yeah, the tone stack isn't very effective, but it's it's rock and roll. It's Malcolm Young on 10, this amp right here. The normal channel, anyway. The reverb channel is a little tamer. Um, doesn't have, you know, the kicked up bass that the normal channel has now. You know, and we can jump the channels and, you know, blend them together to get, you know... A lot of uh, varied and usable tones out of this thing. So, what are we going to do now? Um, so, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap this video up. And we'll have separate videos. I'm going to put this on the Rumble Dino. And there's a, uh, a song or two. I'd like to do, like, you know, a full mix with recording this amplifier mic'd up sounding good. You know, because the old camera phone, microphone sounds like shit anyway. And... As does my guitar playing, but um, hopefully this video was informative to some people about the bypass capacitors and just, uh, you know, having fun with the guts of your amplifier. Not that you should do this on your own because it's dangerous as hell, but uh, hopefully it was fun to watch and hopefully you learned something. So uh, yeah, next up will be demos of this amplifier. Hope to see you then. Thanks for watching. Thanks for coming. Thanks for one of these if you do it. And uh, rock on dudes who do that. Done!